lots on my mind over the last <clears throat> couple of weeks. But I didn't think that I could get it all uh, organized in my brain. And then uh, all of a sudden it sort of organized itself, so that's always helpful. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. I always think that the closer it comes to the Sunday that we're here, I still try to maintain not forcing it. It seems like as soon as you force it, it's, it's not... It's not his words, it becomes your words. So. Anyhow, I did title this sermon the $2,000 sermon. And uh, you'll see why as we get into it. So I asked the question, uh, what is reality? What is reality? Like we can think of reality of the current weather today. We can think of realities that we're a part of for work or for relationships or different things. Um, but on a bigger scale, I, I just wrote above that, what is reality, creation, and evolution, right? Them are two things that are taught, that are debated, that are part of our life kind of almost every day, whether we uh, stop to think about it or not. Um, and then below that, I wrote, how is reality perceived? And then sometimes when I use words, I always think it's one thing if I understand them, sometimes I don't. Um, so I always double check on, on dictionary meaning. So perception is the ability to see, hear, or become aware of something through the senses, right? So when you decide on what reality is, how do you interact with it? How do you perceive it? And then I ask, is reality relative? And that's kind of where we're at today is because we have decided to make reality whatever we want it. If Luke wants one version, if I want a different version, if Samantha wants a different version, we just figure out, and we'll even now with the information that we have available to us, we'll go on the internet and we'll print off the 10 articles that support my theory, and then you'll go and print off the 10 articles that support your theory, and then we'll argue about it. And so we actually can't find a clear ground on what truth or reality is. And so I said, if reality is relative to an individual, then morals can be relative as well. Uh, if you want to turn a nation upside down, don't come at it head on. Just erode at its morals and you will undermine reality itself. And once you have done that, you can rewrite history which is probably the most dangerous thing and you can see how they've done it and that oh, yeah. is scary right so anyhow i have talked to many people uh, some over this last week and one of the things that i keep bumping into is i met this fella at the basketball and i've seen him i'm sure that i seen him shortly after i was done high school and he would have been he would have been in junior high early junior high when i was finishing high school he's in call or in university now and it's king's college and i'm like oh king's college i was there for some continuing credits for my pesticide applicator course and it's a christian college and i'm like oh isn't that a christian college and he's like yeah it is i'm not a christian and i'm like well i'm a part-time preacher i said we should talk about that and he just <laughs> he just smiled at me and anyhow uh, i always bump into him so we're going to pick that conversation up again but what i noticed when he said that to me it was a very indifferent comment hmm. right he wanted to be very clear um, so I have noticed the people that I have talked to have become indifferent to philosophical discussions of any kind and now I just wrote uh, philosophical relating to relating or devoted to the study of fundamental the fundamental nature of knowledge reality and existence how many people do you know they don't even really care anymore, right? They don't care about what happens after they die. They don't care about what's going on around them. They care about what's going on in their life, but definitely not on any grander scale of any kind. Um, I have talked to people who say they literally don't care about what happens after death. And when I hear that, that is something that sort of just tweaks me a little bit because for whatever reason, I cannot accept that. It just goes against everything that is in me when I hear that. And so 
uh, this is where the $2,000 sermon comes in, is this week in Worsley, we had a uh, power outage. It, it went at 2.30 in the morning, give or take, and for whatever reason, seven minutes after the power went off, I woke up. I don't know if there was a beep in the house, or I don't know what woke me up, but I woke up, and then I looked, and I can see Benny Hale's yard light from my place. So I'm always looking up at his yard light, and you can see lights in the distance or whatever, and I noticed it was dark. All of Worsley was dark. And so right away, I'm like, this isn't the power coming down our road. This is a big deal. So I walked out the door, and I started uh, the vehicle that was plugged in already. So I'm like, if I don't start it now, a couple hours, it won't start. And so then I went and split some wood at <clears throat> 3 o'clock in the morning, got the fire in the house going. And then because of my, my oil field experience, I used to always have to drive the power lines when our power would go out at work and it was always a tree and it was down by your down at the next road over from your grandpa's anyhow i would phone the atco guy and i would tell him where the tree was down and i would tell him what breakers were tripped he would meet me there and then we would we would cut the tree off together whatever it took right so anyhow i'm driving down the highway towards where our acreage was and there's a truck coming down the running lake road now this is about four in the morning and I'm playing oil field worker in the middle of the night and I'm all excited. And uh, here, I meet the ADCO truck at the highway at the same time. And here is the guy that I worked with 20 years ago down that road. Really? Wow. Anyhow, we both look up and at the end of the running lake road, if I say the pole, I know John knows the pole. There's a pole across the running lake road, across the highway, and it holds two sets of three phase wires that come into it. And that pole literally has had a crink in it mm. as long as I can remember. And if you tell the right person, they're like, oh yeah, I always, I remember seeing that pole with that bend. Well, it snapped four feet from the top. And so me and Rob looked up at it at the same time. We had our windows down and we're chatting. And Rob's like, oh man, I kind of hoped that it was just a tree on the line. <laughs> He's like, this is a major. So they ended up having to dispatch five trucks out of Peace River get a big, like, and that's no slouch of a power pole, right? So they get this power pole. Well, you can imagine uh, when people started finding out and they extended the time of a power outage when it's 40 below. So what is one thing that's important to keep running when it's 40 below? Your furnace, yeah. right? Some sort of heat source. So we had an alternate source of heat in the house, but many people didn't. So by about 4.30, 5 o'clock, I had, I had, the shop was getting down to 12 degrees Celsius, and I have all my chemical in there, and the water in there, so I'm like, I don't have an alternate source, and I want to be a rock star, and I want to get power to everything. So I go, and I decide to open the doors on the shop, take the tractor out, dig the PTO generator, I open the doors, 2 degrees, right? I lose 2 degrees in the shop, it's now at 10. I dig the old PTO generator out of the snowbank, bring it up to the shop, I'm not going to work on it when it's 40 below in the dark outside. So then I open the doors to take it in, two more degrees, I'm down to eight degrees. Now I'm thinking that I'm committed to this. So I start rigging up this generator to back feed my panel. Long story short, <laughs> who here likes electricity? <laughs> we all use it, so we all like it. We will all say that like we, we take it for granted. We just started saying some of the things we were thankful for this morning. Yeah. Electricity, oh my goodness, are we ever reliant on it. So we all do. Who here has a good understanding of it? Like a great understanding of it, okay? Like not just I turn the light switch on, I can black the gold and the white to the whatever. I mean like a thorough understanding of it. Well, if Anna was here, she'd tell you. Okay, a lot of people, like as far as I have some electrician friends, so as I say this, they're likely going to cringe a little at my interpretation of it because it's, it's not a thorough understanding. Um, who has a good understanding of it? If, you, if your way of life is affected by it, I guarantee you that you're going to want to learn about it. Okay. So in 40 Below, the power's out, it becomes a primary concern. You remember how in life we, we put things in orders and then we look at the thing that's most important into our life and that's why I said sometimes with our faith we, we claim that it's the most important thing but by all forms of reality looking in in our life we could, we could gauge pretty quickly where like I think that's about fourth on your list or for some people it's tenth on their list. 
it's easy to say it's primary concern in my life, but does it actually roll out that way? Um, so with the power outage, I said, when it becomes part of life or death or freezing water pipes or wrecking a high consequence, let's go with that word, high consequence, you will care about it. I do not care who you are. Mm. And then the next thing I wrote here, is the existence of life not the same thing? I can ask you about life now and you can tell me all you want, that you don't care about what happens after death and it's not a concern of yours. At some point in your life, when that narrows in on that, you will care. It's just like when the power goes off at some point. If we know it's a half hour power outage in 40 below, big deal. A 12 hour power outage, Ooh. trust me, you will change your tune. <clears throat> We might say we don't care about it, and in the end, we will all care in one respect or another. What is the greatest gift to humankind? You've heard me say this a million times, huh? Salvation. Free choice. Free to choice. Choose. Salvation. Salvation. To choose salvation. Okay? Yes. What is free choice the ability of? This is crazy to think about. For me, I just sometimes I just sit there and I think about all these things, and I'm like, I can say free choice all I want. But what, what is it the ability to do? What am I having the free choice of? Right? And so then I think of all the species on the planet. Who has the ability to reason? Yeah. We do. Yeah. Right? Mankind, humankind has the ability to reason. And through that ability to reason, we have the ability of free choice. So to reason and exercise free choice... We need one key ingredient. I often think of the Garden of Eden too, right? But that was kind of secondary to my line of thinking as I was writing this. Two things that are different. I can tell you you have free choice, but unless you need to exercise it, what, what is it? It's just something that's sort of stagnant and it just sits there, right? And, and that was no different than the garden. Something created perfect, and you're like, well, what is perfect? Well, what is it if there's nothing that's opposite to it? How is there any sense of reason in that? Um, so then I just come back again on this broad topic of evolution and creation. And uh, I'm going to butcher this, but I was with an electrician buddy this weekend. And he had made a comment. I'm not sure if I'll repeat myself in here. But he said um, we were talking about grounding because that was part of the error of what I had did wrong. And, and when I had hooked up this generator... And he said, what are we but water? And he said something else. I wish I had recorded him. What are we but water? And I want to say he said something like dust. And I'm like, well, isn't that fascinating? No, we are like a little battery, right? We go to sleep, we get fed, and we just keep going and going and going. And I mean, until, until death, right? So what is the body made of? The human body contains around 20 different elements, mostly made inside ancient stars. Okay, and then I just wrote below that as I printed this article. Uh, is this a reality or an opinion? To, to, to me, it's an opinion. That's one version, evolution and ancient stars, so I'm going to give that under the opinion. But this is in a scientific article. If you deconstructed the 80 kg uh, human into atoms, you would get about the following amount of different elements. Oxygen, 52 kg. This element makes up more than half of the mass of your body, but only one quarter of the atoms. Carbon, 14.4 kg. And then in a different article I read, Carb it said carbon is the chemical backbone of life on Earth. What are we made of? Right? And again, I am not well versed on scientific. When I hear carbon and I hear dust, to me, they almost kind of come a little bit together, right? And so then the most important structural element and the reason we are known as carbon-based life forms, about 12% of your body's atoms are carbon. Hydrogen, 8 kg, the hydrogen atom in your bodies were formed in the Big Bang. Now hear me with this, right? Because I'm giving you one set of an opinion. <clears throat> and the others were made inside a star long ago and were flung into space by a supernova explosion. So though you have heard you were stardust, that isn't strictly true. Really, really, that's not strictly true. Okay, on we go. Uh, the foremost abundant nitrogen, 2.4 kg. 
the four most abundant elements in the human body, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, account for more than 99% of the atoms inside you. They are found throughout your body, mostly as water, but also as components of biomolecules, proteins, fats, DNA, and carbohydrates. And then I have just wrote outside of the article here, roughly 99% of the mass of the human body is made up of just these four elements with a lot of them in the form of water. And for an adult male, that's about 60% of the human body is made of water. So flip with me to Genesis 2.7. Now I gave you some science, some scientifics that they're true. Science, that part of the science is true. And then they coupled that with an evolutionary opinion. And now I want an alternate opinion because if we don't have two alternate opinions, how are we going to exercise our free choice? How are we going to exercise, right, our discernment? So Genesis 2, 7, then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils and the man became a living person. Okay, now after that, I wrote this. Now, I want to be fair to the atheist here. I expect to be treated fair, and I must equally treat people fair. At this stage of the game, could we classify both of these things as an opinion? Yes. Yes. I gave you a evolutionary opinion, and now I want to give you a creation opinion. The opinion of stardust and the Big Bang, supernova, and evolution. And then I put the opinion of God's supernatural intervention on humankind. Right? If you're going to discount one, why would you not discount the other? That is always my thing <coughs> with evolution. Is they say, well, you can't be certain. And you can? Hmm. How does that happen? Right? So now... Yeah. Before, we were letting uh, history rewrite itself. And now I'm going to back up before I get any further to finish my story of the generator. When I dug it into the shop, a generator has a four-wire plug on it. So what are they? Two watts, 120 and 120. They have a neutral and they have an earth ground. Okay? Mm. So when I dug it into the shop, I only have welder plug-ins in my shop that I would plug my <laughs> three wire, okay? If you hear of anybody <laughs> in a power outage that is gonna hook their house up to three wire, just start screaming at them and tell them not to. So I didn't have any four wire plugs, so I couldn't make a four wire jumper cord back to my shop. So I thought, whatever, I'll make a three wire and I'll back feed my welder plug in. So I took the time at 4.30 in the morning to take the generator all apart, run a wire through it, hook up a female welder plug in on the outside of the generator. I clip the two watts on the four wire. I hook them to the, the two sides of my three wire welder plug in. And then I snipped the earth ground and I plugged it to the earth ground. And then I made my suicide cable. A suicide cable just means that it has two live ends on it. So when you plug the one into the end generator, don't stick your tongue on the other end. It's live, right? So then, now we're rolling in on six in the morning, okay? And I, I, sometime, maybe it was later, whatever. I'm kind of, whatever. Anyhow, I plug it in, and then I'm like, oh, why didn't I not go to the house and shut off all the breakers? I shut off all the breakers in the shop. Uh-uh, I had to be a rock star, and I was going to light the whole place up because this is a 20-kilowatt generator. So I fired her up, and I had lights and everything. Just and, then they, and I'm like, ah! And then Melissa phones me, and I'm like, well, this can't be good. And the uh, printer in the house literally started snapping and popping. And I think it started smoking. It stunk like, you know, electrical fires are. And it's on the opposite side of the house. And Melissa heard it or smelled it or whatever happened. And so then I unplugged the generator. No. Lo and behold, by the time the dust settled, I believe that I took out the toaster. Uh, I took out two Milwaukee battery chargers in the shop. Three lights that I know of. And the furnace. Oh, no. And the furnace. So right oh. now I'm sitting at $1,400 into the furnace. And anything that was plugged in like small capacitors, you would blow the capacitor, right? So what was my intent when I started this whole project? It wasn't to do that. Things, things weren't going well in life, right? It's 40 below. 
I didn't care about power the day before. Why didn't I hook up the generator the day before? The power was on. I didn't need it in my life until all of a sudden I needed it in my life. And then I start just monkeying around and winging it. That's what I did is I wung it. And then all of a sudden I blew everything up. I fried a lot of stuff. And I'm like, I wish, I wish I had to learn some of this. So, right, the only difference I was joking with people is I was playing oil field worker all night and I was all excited because that was my career for 20 years. Do you know what the one difference was? I was playing with my own money instead of somebody else's. So you sort of feel that a little bit more. So anyhow, so I'm going to come back and, and you'll see how this all comes together at the end. Uh, so I said, as now I talked about stardust and I talked about creation and I talked about evolution, I told you the story about the power outage. And then I basically wrote here, uh, let's be fair and say those two opinions are exactly that, opinions. How can we not be deceived and determined truth? Does anybody ever study the word deception? Has anybody ever been deceived and knew it? Knew that you were deceived? That is one of the trickiest things in the world because by its definition, when you are deceived, you have sort of shut your brain off to truth. You're in it. You are currently in the deception, right? Your brain has already decided to go along with whatever the case is. So how do we determine truth? And I just wrote here two metrics that I use to determine truth uh, are science and history, right? So now my worldview, creation and evolution, God gave us science, and I wrote true science does not lie. True science does not have an opinion. True science does not have a slant. And so a lot of that stuff, and I read in that article to you, is 100% true. The science component of it was absolutely true. And then they inserted some opinions that took it not true. So then I said, the other place to look for truth is in history. And what did I start this whole talk off? Why do we want to undermine morals? Why do we want to change? Because then we can do what? We can change history. If I, if I smother you all in so much information that you don't care about it anymore, what makes you think you're going to care about history anymore? You'll, you'll write that off just like everything else. Just like my wiring episode, I can make up whatever I want, and it might half work, like it did. <laughs> it might not work at all, which some of it didn't. Or it might have great consequence, which it did which it did very much. In the end, in the end, in the end, there is only one way to wire it right. And no alternate reality is going to change that. I do not care what anybody says about wiring, right? You want to hook it up wrong. So Luke is going to come and read for us. And he has a bit of an extended read. And uh, part of the alternate uh, opinion is to read um, the Christmas story, right? That is going to line up with creation. So we it was Luke 2. Yeah, Luke 2, 1 to 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Oh. Uh, from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered this census first took place while Quirinus was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, every one to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of this house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, and his, which is his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the, I can't see the glasses, <laughs> uh, were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, 
and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And they were great. Uh, then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring good tidings, for great, a great joy which will be to the people. For there is born to you this day of the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will be you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to the God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see things see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has come known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known <clears throat> the saying which was told to them concerning the child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things <coughs> which were marveled, uh, sorry, uh, which were marveled at those things which were told them by, by the shepherds. But Mary kept all those things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherd returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, and it was told to them. Thank you. I know what you mean by your arms have to get longer to read now. <laughs> Thanks, Luke. Okay, yeah. so we're coming in on Christmas, and we've all heard that inside the church a hundred times. And I just thought when you are faced with two alternating realities, you need to choose. And being indifferent doesn't count. Mm -mm. Sitting on the fence doesn't count. And I said from the minute that this happened and was recorded in history, right? So we're looking at it from a historical viewpoint. People have been trying to change it, cover it up, and or give you so much information that you become indifferent to the whole thing. Does anybody actually realize that in the world we live in? Everybody can sit there and put a checkbox by that and be like, there is lots of times in my life I don't live by the reality yeah, that I is. attest to, and it's because we are just inundated with information. Yeah. And that's all they're trying to do is rewrite history. So I closed with this. Um, you can backfeed your panel incorrectly <laughs> and you will fry something. You <laughs> have that free choice. <laughs> right, you will. There was more electrical smells from burning something. And, and then I wrote this and after I wrote it, mm. I wanted to cross it off mm. and I never did. Yeah. You backfeed your life incorrectly and you will fry something. Absolutely. And I said that was a bit of a bad joke because the first thing that come to my mind is that a friend I have in my life and he says, you're telling me that there's a God that's going to scorch my ass if I do it wrong. And I thought, you know what? That's not him. Mm -mm. We do that to ourselves. And you know what? I've said that a million times. Is I said, I, I have never been to heaven and I have never been to hell. And there is description of hell in the Bible. Mm -hmm. and, and the first description that always pops into my brain is when Jesus says they were throwing uh, out a uh, gnashing of teeth to Gehenna, I think, right, is the correct term for hell that was used. And that version uh, was a garbage dump, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes our brain takes us to the lake of fire, which also is in the Bible. Um, but I, I tell my friends... If that's the version of hell um, that your brain goes to, let's just back up the bus a little bit. And if there is a reality of good versus evil, if there is a reality of right versus wrong, if there's a reality of all sorts of goodness, and there's a reality of being separated from that, I think that we can leave the, the scorching your ass out of it. I really do. I think that we can look at it and say, if you know that something is true, why would you simply not want to move closer to that instead of further away from it? 
right? And my heart bleeds for that. And, and when we talk about that, I say that, that you won't hear that spoke from the pulpit very much because what well, you're using a word that is not accustomed to, to these buildings, that's the people that we live with. We need to be able to speak truth and we need to be able to reason with our friends and our neighbors. Why do you care? I said, because I, I only go after the people I care about most. Well, leave me alone. I can't. I can't. It's not in my nature. And then I wrote, the stakes are high and the consequences are high. So that's the way I left it. Right. We have a grandson. Oh, he's about 15, 16, maybe 17 now. Tells us it doesn't matter to him when he dies. He'll just go to hell. Oh, I'll be no. dead anyway. I'll be dead anyway. I won't know. And so sometimes what, what I think... Do, what do you do with that situation? You, you actually... So I talked to a guy. He left the gymnasium yesterday. And Kenzie said, you should speak on basketball because I helped coach two teams. And I said, there will be a day that I will. And I felt like that fellow, he is the best player on the team. And he fouled out. And he went from being the best player on the team to the worst player on the team with his attitude. And I followed him out the gym. And I found him in the hallway, and I think <laughs> Kyle said something about dads being weird. And and I thought, but if, if I don't come and talk to this kid, who is? Yeah, and I right. told this kid, I'm like, the potential that you have is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. And when I walked up to him, do you know what I said? Can I talk to you about something? Because before, just like you said, your nephew, you don't go and ram things down people's throats. Mm -hmm. That is not going to happen. And when he looked at me, he said, yes, you can. And I said, okay. If he had said no, I would have simply said, have a good day. I would have turned around and I left. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's the part I believe with everybody. Your friends, the people you care about most. Can I share something with you? And just like I did today, be open to an alternate reasoning. They have a different viewpoint and you need to be able to hear it. Right? That is their opinion where they currently live, reside in their headspace. And so you just need to say, are you open to hearing something different so that you can go away and reason these two things? I, I believe that very much. All right, please. Thank you, Chris, for sharing that with us this morning. And uh, let's hope we learn to plug in things the right way. <laughs> Let's bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you and thank you for this uh, morning that we've, given, uh, we've spent with you. And just uh, mm -hmm. pray that you would uh, keep it in our thoughts and our mind throughout this week. That we can build on it and uh, grow with you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming. And yeah, don't forget.